special s surprise guest, a living legend, Wes Clark Jr. The cavalry has arrived back at Rebel headquarters. What's up, dude? How you doing, brother? Hi, good? Wes. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I got in like late last night and uh, I hadn't been online in about two weeks and my mind was kind of blown this morning. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah! Did you, oh, that's a, that's a great question. Did you have any sense of the magnitude of the coverage and what? None, none. Did you even know about the iconic picture that that? Or, yeah, I got I got it shown to me uh, last night when I got in by my wife. Oh, you got it shown to you last night. You yeah. didn't know about it when it was happening, and it's getting spread all across the internet. Dude, and, you understand? We didn't. I didn't have internet connection uh -huh. or Wi-Fi or anything where we were. And the only place I had a phone connection was like on the second floor of the hotel, like towards the front of the casino. That was it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. That's, okay, so there's a thousand questions I gotta ask you. It's the most amazing experience of my life. How happy are you? Happier than I've ever been in my life, ever. Okay, so in, in just on the off chance that some of you watching uh, didn't don't know all the details, let me just quickly fill everybody in, and then I'll explain why. Uh, because I really want to talk about you being happy, which is, of course, I want to talk about the larger story too. But so, uh, so Wes, um, what? Do you, how do you think? It's a month ago, two months ago. Uh, I think it was All Souls Day. Uh huh. I think November first. November first. Or so, the thirty first. This is a little over a month ago. Uh, comes up with an idea. Hey, why don't we get some veterans to go back up uh, to go to Standing Rock and and. Back up the the water protectors that have been there all along, and you said it. I thought you said it first on old school on our shows. Uh, yeah, probably. Yeah, and so, and I remember thinking, well, that's a good idea. It seems hard to put together. I hope you can do it, right? And when you first thought of that, how many veterans you thought you were going to get together? I honestly thought uh, that we get like five hundred, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know. After a week or two, I think we had like twelve people. Uh -huh. I was like, "Oh man, uh, you know, we'll have as many as you know God feels we need, or something like that." Uh -huh. And then uh, the weekend after the election, I wrote the operations order for it um, with Michael Wood, and uh, we put it on Facebook. I think like that next Monday after the election, and then we had um, after a week, I think we had like fifty people. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we raised about three thousand dollars, and I figured, I thought, you know, we need like thirty grand uh, to get gas masks and shit for people. And then uh, there was an article on this on this website called Task and Purpose, mm -hmm. which talked about the operations order, and uh, that was only like, I mean, I, I don't know when it was. It doesn't feel like it was very long ago. I think it was like two and a half weeks before we went out there, and then we had like eight hundred people sign up. Within a couple of days, and then 900, and then we got up to 2,000. And we said, um, "Don't anyone else come?" Like 2,000 is like the absolute limit because I got a friend named Sadef who's like, "You know, 2,000 people are gonna say they're come, but then 1,500 people will show up." Yeah. So we're like, "Okay, that's cool. So we'll yeah. keep it at 2,000, and we'll plan for between 1,500 and 2,000." Dude, 4,000 veterans showed up. It's insane. It's amazing, man. Amazing. It was. It was. I mean. We, we didn't have the facilities for him. We didn't have the tents for him. We didn't have the heaters. The GoFundMe campaign, the money started to roll in like within 10 days of our going, but it takes like a week or did. I mean, I think they cleared it up in the account, but it takes a week till the funds are even available. So I think we'd only spent like twenty or $30,000 um, when we were like just a couple days out from it. Mm -hmm. And you know now they've totally blown through the money on uh, buses and Airline tickets and stuff. The rental car fees for Jordan in North Dakota is killing us. So, like, yeah, you, you know, like. A lot of people were in the cars too. The, it's literally like 10 times what I would pay here in LA or Miami. No, they're just, 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 the corporation is just trying to jack you. Yeah, and they, boy, they jacked us on that. You know and, what? And, and the hotels, like, ironically, when the mainstream media comes in after we've been covering it day, you know, day and night for months and stuff. Uh, they take all the hotel rooms. They're like, "Yeah, it's uh, our our stars are here. We'll pay whatever. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter." Jordan had to sleep in a hallway. Jeez. Jordan only had to sleep in a hallway one night. But dude, we were literally okay. Here's what happened. Okay, there was a blizzard that came in Monday after this yeah. ceremony, and it snowed everybody into the casino. I mean, they closed all the roads. You couldn't get out. The gas station ran out of gas the next day, mm -hmm. and we were all stuck there. And it was at like quintuple capacity. 
So you had hundreds of people sleeping on the floor of their, yep. you know, auditorium in there. And you had, we lost our room because mm-hmm. uh, there were like eight or nine of us into a double. Uh-huh. That I mean, I was, I only slept about an hour and a half a night uh-huh. uh, at the most the whole time I was there. So because you run and organizing this, dude, logistics. Well, here's that. the thing: it's it's not organizing stuff and logistics that it's that it was constantly changing every second. There were like a million different factions in the camp and in the tribe, and and the veterans. There were like multiple veterans groups there, and every, you have to coordinate with everybody and make sure folks are on the same page. And then our original plan was we we're going to do some kind of ceremony the morning of the 5th, and then we go to the front lines, and then we get there, and the elders are like, dude, there's no front lines. You're going to pray, and you're going to do total, like, you know, disengagement, and you're going to do prayer. And we're mm-hmm. like, okay, you're in charge. Mm-hmm. So that all changed. Um, and I got to say, dude, it was the most spiritual, satisfying experience of my life. Those, those 48 hours in that c- casino as it snowed, I felt bad for the people at Fort Yates. I felt bad for the people that had stayed at Camp Ossetti. But man, it was like magic in there. So let me let me give more details for, but no, for we the were, folks. I, like, okay, Tuesday night, we had a room that like, a, I don't know, it was one, two, three, four, five, eight of us were sleeping in because mm-hmm. I was able to fit in for about 45 minutes the night before between a desk and a chair and then our press agent who was sleeping under the desk <laughs> with their head against the TV. Uh-huh. And after an hour, I'm like, fuck this, I can't sleep like this. And then the last night, we had some security issues and uh, I had to go take care of them. When I came back to the room at like 10 or 11 at night, um, our S2 and another person are out in the hall. I'm like, where's everybody? I'm like, dude, our room got turned into a women's shelter. So all our stuff got taken out. And I'm like, fuck, well, we're we gonna sleep. He goes, nowhere. I'm like, okay. <laughs> So, <laughs> wow. so um, I, I one of our videos on Facebook. Um, so, uh, because Chris Huck was there, Dennis Trainer was there, Jordan's there, you and Michael Wood. I stopped. Are there. I stopped in and talked to Jordan a little bit when he okay. was in his room. Good, because he. I think he was co-located with Michael Wood. Yeah. So uh, Chris, uh, who's from our Pittsburgh office, who's also a veteran, mm-hmm. um, uh, he was Master at Arms. Mm-hmm. He's in the Navy, and Master at Arms is such a badass title. It's almost as good as the cavalry. <laughs> okay, it's pretty and good. he was a special, so I think weapons procurement specialist or something like that. Means and he's he got guns. weapons and he's got a specialist in it. It's super badass. Anyway, he's doing a Facebook Live video there, and you see everybody's on the floor, right? But you know what it looks like? It looks like barracks, right? In, in some ways. And Dude, it was like a sleepover with like thousands of your best friends that you just met. Yeah, and and so he went and found uh, somebody who had our. Um, uh, Standing Rock shirt, mm-hmm. you know, from TYT, and he's like, oh, and he's and, and he was a Keegan, <coughs> and he was a member, right? And he's came in from Alaska. Jeez, he's been in the Air Force for twenty Dude, years. Dude, I met Keegan on in Mandan yesterday morning. Oh, see we, that? wait, he's uh, he's biracial. He's yeah, 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 no. Fucking crazy, dude. What are the chances of that? I know, right? Out no, of four thousand guys. No, no, we had even cra- that yesterday was crazy. So. There was a lot of drama, like in danger on on uh, the night before, and I took off. I thought I was about to get whacked. Going back to the good news, right? Sure. So I, I'm looking at Chris's video of the floor, and Ke- he goes to talk to Keegan, and so the guy's been in the Air Force for 20 years, and and he t- he talks the way you do, and it makes me almost want to join the military. And he's <laughs> like, uh, Oh yeah, I was logistics, kicking kicking cans. It's like that sounds so cool. I don't know what it is, but it sounds so cool. He's like, you know, uh, gear in the rear. I was like, what? Okay, yeah, that, yeah, go Keegan. <laughs> so, uh, and it looked super fun, right? I mean, obviously, you're there for a very, very Dude, serious if, thing. Yeah, I got to tell you, if I, if every day in the army was like what I experienced out there, I never would have left. Those are the best people I ever met in my life. Mm-hmm. No joke, the yep. best. Yeah. And so, and here they are for a great, great cause. And one of the main things I want the audience to understand is um, happiness is a great goal, and, and, and you should go for it. We just talked about it in old, last night's old school mm-hmm. episode. But fulfillment is the best thing in the world. Mm-hmm. It's a hell of a drug, right? How good does fulfillment feel? I gotta say, man, I've never, every day out there was like magic. I've never felt better. Not just about me, but I've never felt like my heart was so open in my life. And it just feels like it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's just a feeling of love. And it's wonderful. 
And I pity people that don't get to feel that. Yeah. No, I, I really need you to think about that because what, whatever it is that you want to do, okay? Now, for me, I got my causes. Wes obviously did this wonderful thing and they're going to do a lot more coming up. Um, but if you get involved and you actually have an effect like they did, oh. First of all, getting involved, period. But, but is I got to say, Dude, we just got there for the victory party. I mean, no, really, that was no, water no, no. protectors and the youth and no. everything else. They did all the hard work, and we showed up at the end. That was it. So, like, if you talk to any of our guys at Wolfpack in the states that have won, that lasts a lifetime, man. Mm -hmm. You go back and talk to the guys from New Jersey, Vermont, Illinois, California, uh, and now most recently the Rhode Island team. There's no better feeling when you do something not just for yourself, but for others and for so it's you think it's corny but it's not it mm -hmm. feels great mm -hmm. it's you should it, it's you should do it for yourself right no you shouldn't do it for yourself you should do it for other people with uh -huh. no expectation of any reward and willing to sacrifice absolutely everything for it and you'll never feel better in your whole life yeah. ever that's right and so now Wes is is being humble and and bless no, his heart. I'm not being I'm not being humble I'm serious it's not about being humble it's about really Genuinely putting your shit on the line and not giving a fuck what you get back from it, other than that you know you did the right thing. No, I agree with you completely on that. But I do want to say, look, if Wes and Michael Wood and everybody else involved and uh, had not had it out there, I'm I don't think we get the result that we get. So and and if you say give most of the credit to the water protectors, I say of course. Right, Dude, they, they they got shot with the rubber bullets. They got sprayed. They got gas. They you know don't. I mean, and so, they were there when nobody was on their side. That's right. So they were there before uh, Amy Goodman showed up. Before we showed up. Before anybody showed up. Before the veterans showed up. Mm -hmm. And they went there not because they thought cameras were going to come. Not because they thought the cavalry <coughs> was going to come. They were out there because they're Standing Rock. Yeah. And and so and I've talked a lot about Sioux Nation and how they do not. They do not concede, okay, and and they're right, and they would not budge, okay. So the, of course they get the lion's share of credit, but while they were out there, Obama was like, "Let's see how it plays out." Yeah. Right, and anyway, I, I don't want to get too political, but I I do want to say, all of a sudden, two they what they thought was two thousand veterans turned out to be four thousand veterans are going to show up. All of a sudden, the police move back. Uh, the state police open up the roads. All of a sudden, the Army Corps is a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, open to discussion. I'd All love to know the Army Corps guy uh, who decided not to kick us off and to do the easement, to cancel the easement, because he probably saved a lot of people's lives, and he saved a lot of people from violence and arrest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they did the right thing. Uh, it was helpful to have almost literally an army of veterans. Now, this is a nonviolent army, no one was allowed to bring weapons, etc. Yeah. But to have an army of veterans show up at your doorstep and say, we're the ones who knock. <laughs> and so, uh, so when that happened, all of a sudden, you know, hey, look, that's the cavalry. The, the cavalry isn't there for the whole fight, but they do come in and make a difference at the end. Yeah. And so you went there with the best of intentions. And, and, so, and one more thing about that, guys. In the first two weeks, when you only had 12 people sign up, it's easy to get discouraged. And so I wasn't I, discouraged. But he wasn't discouraged. And every person who I've ever talked to, whether it's Wolfpack, it's the Cavalry, it's anyone who's ever done, accomplished anything, they didn't get discouraged. Because it's so easy to get discouraged. You're not wrong to get discouraged. When no, it, when it looks like nobody's showing up. It looks like when you got no Cavalry, it looks like you know that it's an impossible task and everybody's telling you it's impossible it's hard not to get discouraged but i'm telling you hang in there do it for the right reasons do it for everyone else and you might be amazed at the result and so here we uh, president obama and army corps came out and said okay you're not going to drill we're going to deny the easement now there's an environmental impact statement that they've ordered that takes months maybe years We'll see if Trump violates the law and uh, and gets rid of the environmental impact statement, and so that'll be very interesting. But right now, that company uh, is in a world of trouble because some of their contracts run out on January first, and the people that they made deals with 
think, wait, you want me to take over a piece of this? No, that's, that's, not, that's not the problem. What it is is <coughs> when you build a contract, you're negotiating a 20-year deal on the price of whatever you're transporting through based on when that contract was made. So the price of oil and gas was way higher in 2014 when the deal was signed. And of course, it'll be much lower now because I think it was like over 100 something uh, at that time and now it's below 50. Yeah, it's so around it's less than half. Yeah. But the other thing is what we were worried about out there is, you know, these instigators were there and they were trying to cause violence because if the police can say, oh, it's a riot, well then the insurance kicks in for them and they get their money back. Mm. So there was a financial incentive, aside from intimidating people and hurting them, there was a financial incentive in order to force people to react with violence. And it existed the entire time out there. Mm -hmm. So every time you see people getting shot with you know, rubber bullets and sprayed in the face and beaten up, it's in order to get them to fight back so they can get more money. It's insane. Wow. That's and, the motivation. And CNN played out that narrative. You know, you know why? Coverage? Because because they're stupid. Let yeah. me tell you, all those people came in. They came in on, you know, Saturday night, talking on their cell phones, talking about life back home, ignoring everybody who's there in the hotel except trying to get stories with people they think are fucking important or slice of life stories to put in. But they're not talking to the people out there and they don't know what's going on and they don't know research. They have their jobs because they're communication majors at school, which means they're really good looking and they sound, you know, they can do the sound bites and tell a story in 30 seconds. But you know what? They've only got about 40 seconds worth of knowledge on this stuff. So they just don't know what they're talking about. They don't have the money to do any investigative reporting at all because all the money spent on talent. I mean, you worked for MSNBC, which isn't even that successful one, and you got paid a shitload of money to yeah. sit there and not learn anything and not do any research on stuff. Yeah. You know, if you're a, a cable news anchor, now I didn't do it this way, mm -hmm. but I, I know others who did. You can walk in an hour before the show and just read what's in the prompter, and you're done. And you get a big fat check, you get your TV check. They, all the anchors, all the reporters that go out there from the corporate media, they all get nice hotel rooms, et cetera. They don't have to worry about the rental car or the buses or anything like that. Are they gonna They dive? got good communications, they got an editor there to help them, they got yeah. a satellite hookup van, everything else. And when I was on the campaign trail with Bernie Sanders, mm -hmm. a little small interaction with some of the, the mainstream media guys, and they love being jaded. That's their favorite thing in the world. Mm -hmm. So like they love to talk like, oh, what's the big deal? Like from Bernie Sanders, whatever, right? What what hotel are we staying in next? Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's like I know you saw it in a movie and so you wanna you know, like, you know what I'm saying? They're trying to copy what no, they think they No, no, that they're trying to take on a role that they've seen that seems glamorous. That's right. But what you see when you're there is that they're the blind people moving through the world. And it was, it was like crystal clear. Like, the people I'd met in the tribe and the water protectors and everyone that knew that was going, what was going on and what was happening. And then you had these media people come in who, you, they, were, they were blind. They were blind. I mean, they, they cannot see it through their own web of arrogance and self-importance, they cannot see reality directly in front of their face. Mm -hmm. Okay, now final thing, Wes. Uh, you guys aren't done. Um, no, we're so, not done. Yeah, so there's, there's two different aspects of this. Uh, one is... Although it, I gotta say, I can't speak for Veterans for Standing Rock as an organization, because mm -hmm. that would have to be me and Mike Wood, and we'd have to agree on stuff. I'm just telling you what I think. Yeah, of course. So if, if Trump says, ah, environmental impact statement. I'm just not gonna follow it. And he'd be making a very fucking big mistake. Uh, That's what he'd be doing. Uh -huh. He raised an army uh -huh. in two weeks, unpaid, of people willing to go to freezing area on a work week, three weeks before Christmas, to get beaten and put in jail. And we raised 4,000. That's a fucking division, okay? If he does that, he's gonna have a lot of trouble. I can promise you. Mm. Because we follow the law in this country, and that's what we're gonna do from now on. Because the environmental impact statement is the law, and you're supposed to get one, and finally, through all this effort, they got Obama administration, this is nonpartisan, man. We've been busting our ass to get Obama administration to follow the law. Mm -hmm. uh, they finally got an environmental impact statement just like they're supposed to do. And so if he violates the law, it's, it appears that he might have some veterans that are heading back up. Well, listen, here's, listen, Obama violates the law all the time, 
okay? Mm -hmm. I actually have hope that Donald Trump is not going to violate the law mm -hmm. because Donald Trump is different. There's no rules with him in charge, and that's what everybody's fear is, but that's also what my hope is. And I think, you know, if he had the chance to be the greatest president in the history of the world and be loved by doing the right thing, I think he might choose it. So it is even though if you look at the cabinet, you'd say, no way. Right. Yeah, no, it's an interesting hope. You never know. Well, th there are no rules that's got a big downside, and it might have an upside. So I hear you on that. So we'll keep an open mind on that because we don't know what Trump's going to do here, although he is personally invested in this particular pipeline. Dude, right? $2 million to a guy worth the money, he says. I mean, I look. mean, he's willing to scam students with a phony university. I mean, no, he's, listen, hey, that's, he's a good, willing, that's a good point. Yeah, he's willing to have the RNC do their Christmas party at Trump Tower so he can profit off that. Like, he'll go he, yeah, as low as look, he needs to go here's, to make here's, a buck. I know. Here's my thoughts on Donald Trump, okay? I think Donald Trump hates people because he's been wealthy his whole life and that he's realized that the majority of people in his life, they get close to him and want to be close to him and want to work for him. They're doing it not because of him, but for the money or the attention. So think about that. From the time he was a young guy till he was older, he's constantly approached by people toadying up to him. So of course he hates people. Of course he thinks people are chumps because he's surrounded by chumps. You know, it's like, my wife, ex-wife, used to watch The Apprentice. And one thing he said that always kind of stuck with me watching it was that if you hang out with losers, you're going to be a loser. Mm -hmm. So if you hang out with kind of these needy, greedy people who want to use you in life, then that starts to sink into you and that poison starts to get into you. Right. And maybe if he had the chance to see that he could actually be loved by people for the things he does, rather than the things he can give them, he would change his mind. So I'm going to stick with hope for, for the moment being. And stick I, with hope, dude. Until yeah. we know different, stick because with hope. There's, I'll give you one more piece of hope on Trump, which is that he is desperate to be loved. And so if he starts to lose popularity, that, that will bother him, and he will try to become more popular. So if you want to be more popular in this country, you're going to wind up doing the right thing, right? Because the American people, as much as we think that they were misdirected in this election, yada, yada. I think their heart is in the right place. Uh, I, I know we've got some disagreements over that. but and, and, I, and I know because of the polling that they are largely progressive. So he might just crowd surf in the right direction. So And at least we know, like the establishment guys, you know exactly what they're going to do. I can tell you, and I've done, I've done for over a decade, I've been telling you exactly what they're going to do before they do it. Because I know where the money is. It's not at all complicated. I'm not that smart. You can do it too. Follow the money. Wherever the money is, the establishment guys are going to do that. With Trump, there are no rules. So that gives you a sliver of hope along with the possible giant Dude, downside. Listen, there, there's a route out of this for everybody. Okay? A lot of that route is forgiveness. For real. I mean, mm -hmm. look, the oil companies and the politicians and the corporate people, they're terrified about moving forward because they think moving forward means they're gonna be jailed, they're gonna have all their stuff confiscated, everything else. So why not just forgive them and say, all right, it's fucked up. I know you had a lot to do with making this system, mm -hmm. but you're not responsible for the whole system. I mean, none of us are, especially mm -hmm. as individuals. Um, so just quit doing what you're doing and let's fix it. As long and as I they think agree people to quit doing to what it. they're doing, <laughs> then, well, then, then I'm all for truth and reconciliation. Look, look I, I think they will because, hey, man, the reality is if we're not well on the way, and I mean well on the way, like to almost zero carbon emissions in eight years, we're all going to die. And there's nothing that can stop that. And it doesn't matter how much money you have. You won't survive it. Yeah, so you might uh, have disagreements on the time frame, right? If you're a smart, reasonable person. Uh, if you're a blind person, you'll have disagreements. I'm telling you, it's eight years. And mm -hmm. if it's not by 2023, 2024, when the Ogallala Aquifer runs out of water, there's nothing we can do after that. Yeah, so, and, and, and this, I, don't get me wrong. If you're a smart, reasonable person, there's no debate about whether it's climate change and whether it's man-made, it is. Uh, there are, Questions around how quickly the ice caps are melting. There's no question. It was four, It was 35 degrees Celsius above normal last month. There's no question. Mm -hmm. We were at the start of a J curve.
there are gigatons of methane sitting in the permafrost that are about to come out. You know those big holes that yep. came out in Russia? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, it's gonna happen everywhere. It's methane. It's 86 times more potent at focusing greenhouse gases than carbon dioxide. Its only benefit is that it only sticks around for 30 years. And the problem is, once the, the ice caps melt, it's irreversible. So we gotta act right now. Right now, like right. we should have acted 10 years ago. Uh, of course, and so that's why there's a, now a pipeline fight in Texas, and, and there's gonna be one everywhere, because the oil companies and the, and the people that are in power and greedy, et cetera, they're not getting the urgency of the situation. We gotta keep it in the ground. If you don't keep it in the ground, we're not gonna be able to reverse it. So now, finally, it's not the only issue. You guys are also thinking of going other places. I think we're thinking about going to Flint next. That'll be a different kind of action. That'll be like, we gotta get with people who've been on the ground there already, and all mm -hmm. the different groups working on it, and figure out what we can do to help push them over the edge. It's, it'll probably be like going out there and, and rebuilding, uh, you know, redoing plumbing in people's homes and stuff to fix it. But for me personally, and, and I don't know if Michael agrees with it, I, I think each mission, uh, should be to a different kind of threatened community and each should have a very spiritual component to it. So for this one, it was Native American spirituality, which many of us felt was very moving. And I would hope when we go to Flint, it would be African American spirituality, which I also think people are gonna find really moving. Yeah, and and yeah, I, I you're getting me to open up a little bit to spirituality. Good, man, yeah, I want because, you to, because you're gonna because, feel better, Yeah, seriously. Because, you know, I'm, everybody knows I'm agnostic, right? But um, <laughs> this guy tells me that uh, that if you open yourself up to God, the good things are to come. Yeah, they and, are. And you know, being agnostic, that, I'm and that, fairly that skeptical. And that doesn't mean money. Yeah, no, no, no. Or of fame not. or anything else. No. It just means you can feel better. Yeah, it, fulfillment's a hell of a drug. <laughs> okay, and so all of a sudden, though, as I'm skeptical, but this guy keeps bringing results and results and results. So, who knows? We'll see you at the next place. But well, here's the thing. <laughs> I think everybody should get involved everywhere in all of these things, not just our things, but in, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, I got a cough when I was out there. <clears throat> um, you've got nothing to lose because in eight years, if we don't do this, the world is going to start dying and you'll be around when it happens. So you have nothing to lose. You don't have to worry about losing your freedom. You don't have to worry about losing your life because it's gonna end anyway if people don't get involved. So let me end on this, okay. So I, I'm, I'm not a panic guy. Uh, you should be panicked, dude. No, hold, hold on for one second. So on the other hand, I always remember the story of the woman who was in one of the towers on 9-11 and her husband was also in the tower and he was just at a different office building. So she comes in and uh, and she says, we're gonna get out of here. The other tower fell, not fell yet, but got hit. Mm -hmm. We're gonna go, okay? And he's like, no, I'm the manager, and they told us to stay in the building, so I gotta keep my employees here. She's like, I will divorce you the minute I get on the ground. I'm not playing with you. We're going, and we're going right now, okay? So she was an alarmist. So normally being an alarmist doesn't make sense. But sometimes, when the facts are on your side, you should be an alarmist. She got her husband to come down everyone else in the office died. So there's a moment to be an alarmist and this situation on the planet is dire, we have to keep it in the ground. So my guess is over the next four years, there's gonna be a lot of actions. So Wes, thank you for- It's gotta go beyond actions. It's gotta go, look, our human nature and the way we've been trained in this country from childbirth is to obey, okay? Our schools are set up to produce obedient factory workers. Our history textbooks are set up to make patriotic, unthinking citizens. We are bombarded with thousands of messages a day that tell us we can't be good enough unless we buy something or look a certain way or dress a certain way or drive a certain car. And it fills our hearts with all these wants for the shit that we don't need. And we're literally brainwashed and People don't understand, um, we don't really need the government to make any of these changes. We don't need their approval. We don't need any of it. 
This is our very lives that are on the line and the lives of our children. And I'm not going to let anybody steal my kid's future. It's just not going to happen. And the sooner people wake up to the reality of it and start making these changes, the sooner it will happen. Because, you know, we thought about, okay, what if we go to Flint and we protest? Great. Maybe in two years, some guy will lose an election. And then he's still got to go and get shit paid for and raise it and talk other people into doing it. Why wait? Why wait for any of it? If you wait for someone else to lead you, they're leading you to your death. You got to go out and do it. Be the change for real. Yeah. And so when someone asks, who's going to do it skeptically, raise your hand. Okay? Right here. That's right. Raise your hand. Thank you, Wes. Uh, we appreciate it. Bro. You're welcome, bro. All right. Great job. Man. Love you. Yeah. This Love guy, too, man. man.